Good morning. Really looking forward to today. My name is Weston Sprott. I'm the Dean of the Preparatory Division at the Juilliard School and a trombonist in the Metropolitan Opera. And today we're going to have a panel discussion. Talk. Uh, the title is Picture Perfect. And a basic summarization of what we're going to be talking about is what diversity and marketing, marketing materials looks like. Sometimes we have one image of ourselves in print materials and online, and other times that is juxtaposed against a difference in what's happening in reality. We want to have a conversation about, about what that looks like, how people feel about it, and get the feelings and opinions of our excellent panel here. So what I would like to do is just have each panelist give, them, give a brief introduction of who they are. And then we have a handful of questions that are queued up, uh, preloaded questions on Slido that we're going to go through. But in the meantime, please feel free to also contribute to Slido. If you go to slido.com and use uh, join the group Sphinx Connect, there are a couple of options there. There's one option, I think it says Q&A, where if you would like, you can add a question of your own. And there's another section that says live poll. You can go there and you can like a question that's already been loaded into Slido or that someone else asked and the most popular questions will go to the top of the queue. So we'll know that we, those are questions that are popular in the room and that we want to make sure we take the time to answer. So um, I will turn it over to Artina, who you can introduce yourself and then we'll get started. Good morning, my name is Dr. Artina Hamilton. I am the Assistant Director of Talent Acquisition at the Interlochen Center for the Arts. And in my role, uh, in addition, I'm also a faculty member, but in my role, I recruit for faculty for academic and arts positions, and I also work on diversity and equity initiatives as well. Hi, my name is Devin Hinzo. Um, I'm an oboist. Um, I graduated from Manus College with my undergraduate and uh, moved on over to Cleveland, graduated with my master's, uh, first generation college student, so that feels good. Um, thanks. Um, I, I've always been interested in figuring out how things work and I've always dreamed big and that sort of led me to uh, my administrative work. Um, currently, I work with Apollo's Fire, which is the Cleveland Broke Orchestra. I'm the Artistic Operations and Outreach Coordinator. And so with this job, I have a seat at the table in terms of um, artistic planning, looking at the next season, looking at the artists, making sure they get to Cleveland in time and safely. Um, and I'm also really excited about the outreach aspect of it, where I am going to schools and going to different organizations throughout Cleveland and sort of, I'm, I'm the face of Apollo's Fire and I've met some really amazing people there. Um, and on the side, when I'm not uh, doing that, I started uh, my own organization called Fresh Perspectives, and it's um, a music organization, and we liberate artistic expression by breaking down concert formalities, and um, it's an artist-run organization, second year. Um, you can follow us at fpcreative.cle. Good morning, uh, my name is Ahmad Mays. I'm the Director of Education and Community Engagement at the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra. Um, you know, with orchestras, oftentimes this work around diversity, equity, and inclusion um, finds its way to us in the education and community engagement departments. And we know that that's not enough. It's an institution-wide, it should be an institution-wide priority, but um, I have had the privilege to uh, do a lot of work in this arena for our organization and, um, and be able to attend events like this and lead conversations at our organization about how we can become more uh, inclusive, equitable, diverse, and a place of belonging. So it's been a real uh, pleasure to in engage in this type of work. Um, I just wanted to say, when I came to the, the, the plenary last night, I opened that door and I walked into a wall of people, mm -hmm. standing room only, and I just wanted to give it up to the Sphinx organization <laughs> for, I mean, this is just an incredible turnout. Awesome. Well, with that, let's just go ahead and jump right in and get started. I'm going to start with, with Artina. And we're just going to start with a broad question, and over time we're going to, to go in deeper and more specific. But in general, why do you feel like diversity and marketing really matters? I think when we think about um, the performing arts in particular, we know it has historically been a homogenous, very white space. And so diversity is important because, um, as one of my favorite quotes says, you can't be what you can't see. 
So I remember for me, I attended the Youth Performing Arts School in Louisville, Kentucky, and I played the double bass. I didn't see people that looked like me. Thank you, double bass, all right. <laughs> um, I didn't see women playing a double bass. I didn't see black girls playing a double bass. And if I had an organization like the Sphinx, it could have been very transformative for me. But also, we have to really show the reality of what's happening. I think that sometimes when we have advertisements and you don't see your face, you don't see black indigenous people of color, you're like, well, that's a space I can't enter. And so for me, it's very important to show not just the reality, but the possibility. Interesting. Yeah. I think it's, for me, when I'm looking at any material, whether it be a school or an organization that presents, um, I feel really safe in spaces when there's a mix of people. Mm -hmm. And I can almost decide immediately, like, okay, I know that I want to go there. I know I want to be a part of this because there are people of all different colors, shapes, and sizes who are there, and I know I can feel and be myself in this space. Um, so, but it's a really hard balance to, um, you know, tell the right story of what, uh, from the organizational standpoint of what's really happening. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with what both of you have, have stated. It's important to um, find a way to communicate a, um, um, what can be an inclusive experience, a, a uh, experience that um, can resonate with people of all backgrounds, but at the same time achieve a balance that, um, you know, is telling a true story in your marketing materials. I think it's interesting. I, I think back because I've, I've been a part of this, this conference for several years now, and I was on a panel last year, and I think a comment that was made during that panel is part of what spurred the conversation that we're having right now. And uh, that comment was something to the effect of, of a student coming to a senior administrator at, at a school and saying, I think it's really great that we, have, that we have people of color and underrepresented communities in our marketing materials, but we have to be careful to make sure that what we're putting out there is actually some type of reflection of what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. let's, let's not lie to ourselves or lie to the public. And I think that brings up um, another question, which is, who is diverse marketing or diversity in marketing really serving primarily? It, do we feel like this is something that is primarily serving the institution so they can feel better about themselves and put out a better face? Or is, as Artina was mentioning, it's, it's serving the purpose of making sure those, it's, it's actually serving you so that when you look at a brochure or on the website, you feel like this is a place where I belong. If that's not authentic, and then you show up to that place, and they're actually that person who was on the front of the material is not there. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you got hoodwinked? Uh, right. So, any any thoughts about about that? About um, who is who is this diversity marketing really serving? Um, so, like yesterday, uh, something that really struck me with uh, Michael Abel's conversation about musicians and artists being storytellers, and I think that's a really essential component of what we do. And we as musicians um, have a really special place in this sort of, um, in this field where the storytelling that we do doesn't involve words a lot of the time. And um, so with that in mind, I think marketing needs to be driven by storytelling these days. There are so many platforms out there. You know, there's print, there's digital, and then you have all these social platforms that are now branching out into little micro-blogging opportunities for you to really show that you're a dynamic organization. But where I think sometimes um, you can get a little snafu uh, is whose story are you telling? Um, are you, you know, there are a lot of, I hope there are a lot of um, granting institutions that are um, making it making a strong case for DEI in your own cities and organizations. Um, but in Cleveland, I know they're making a really strong effort. And um, sometimes it's really hard to move past the checkpoints like, okay, diversity, got, we have you know, a couple brown people, black mm -hmm. people, great, it's perfect. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we're more than just numbers mm -hmm. and check boxes. We're people, and I think if you really want to tell an authentic story, you should tell the stories of the people you want in, in, your, in your space. You know, get to know them. Um, get to know who they are, what they like, why they're coming here, why they want to come back. You know, um, think of it as like a, a, a development component of relationship building. 
because um, you know, let's be honest, it's been it's been hard for for people of color to break into this space mm -hmm. in a way that we can really truly be ourselves. So um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, and I think by um, sharing stories and getting to know people in a in a very close way can really help amplify your marketing um, approach. Yeah, that's great. I was thinking about what you're saying about authenticity, and there's really no, there's no substitute or replacement for being truly authentic. It's really important that we have that. And it, it brings us to, to the next question, which, which I'll, I'll lean towards Ahmad, which is, how diverse are the groups that are actually creating these marketing materials within yeah. our institutions? Because we know that it's going to be difficult for, for people who are parts of teams that don't actually have the representation amongst themselves to push out something that's truly authentic for, for a really diverse community. Yeah, who, who is doing the work is, is probably, at least in my mind, the, the key issue. Um, and I, I, I looked up the stats. I'm going to just pull it up here really quick. This is a little bit dated from 2014, and I do think that there has been progress in some of these areas. But as of 2014, um, a study was done by the League of American Orchestras on racial, ethnic, gender diversity in the orchestra field. And what we were looking at at that time in 2014 was that amongst musicians, um, African American Latinx representation was 4.3%, staff 8.3%, and then your non white board members were at 7.8%. And um, those very stats are reflective in the marketing staff as well. And I would say um, uh, it's you know, just critical that there be people who uh, can make decisions about marketing who have experience that um, is of the uh, people and communities who we want to engage. Um, uh, you know, and so much of this starts with um, just equitable hiring practices. How do we uh, hire staffs that represent the communities we want to see in our audience. And you talk about things like um, salary transparency. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about uh, things like just paying competitive salaries. Uh, you know, I will say orchestras are notoriously uh, bad at um, providing compensation that can compete with markets outside of, uh, out of the arts. Um, and that limits our options when it comes to who we hire at our organizations. Um, blind screening of, of, uh, of resumes in the hiring process, where you take the name off of the top of the, the resume as you do uh, your evaluation. Also, thinking about culture change as well, so that people who do come into our organizations feel a sense of belonging, feel included in what we're doing. Um, and that's, that's a process. And we've got to find a way to, uh, to change our cultures. So one thing that we've done at the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra that started just this year, some of our, our, our young, younger staff members, um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a senior staff initiative, but really from you know, the management level of our organization, they said, we want an employee resource group. Um, it's not um, you know, an affinity group in the traditional sense where you know, at your large corporations, you might have your African American ERG or your Latino ERG, but this was one that was committed to, dedicated to advancing conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's uh, kind of the foundation. It was uh, is driven by a diverse group of leaders who um, ha have conversations with staff around things like microaggressions, mm -hmm. um, code switching, which so many of us do at work every day. I've had multiple conversations about it already, and it's not even been 24 hours here at Sphinx. Um, and you know, I was amazed that one third of our staff came to the first meeting. There were 30 people in the room. Uh, we had to get a bigger space for the next one. And I think having those types of conversations, engaging staff, being able to um, allow that messaging to, you know, spread across the organization and let new staff members or staff members who um, are underrepresented at our organization know that there are allies there who care about the things um, that will make us a more inclusive, equitable, and diverse organization. Can I add to that? Absolutely. Um, also, I think it's important, going back to what you said, having people that are at the table that typically aren't there. So it's not just your marketing team, it's everyday employees. Um, because when we talk about inclusion, it is also the people that work in the space actually know the space. So for me, when I'm recruiting for interlocking, I can go out with a brochure, but I'm also telling them as a black woman that lives in northern Michigan, 
um, or Southern Canada, that there's another reality, right? And I'm not just here to represent in a symbolic type of way. This is also my experience. I think that's extremely important because frequently we kind of invest in these, as you said, really multicolored, beautiful Benetton ads, but there's nothing beyond that. So what does that mean, even if we have the representation, are those people in key roles? Yeah. How are they actually making big strategic decisions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's great. It's, I was thinking about a lot of things when, when both of you were speaking in different directions that we could take this. Uh, one of them was the idea that oftentimes we think about marketing materials, we're thinking about images, right? We're thinking, mm -hmm. is like, some, like I think it was you said, is, is there a black face, is there a brown face, is there yeah. this, is, is there a whatever? And oftentimes a lot of artistic organizations don't actually have that representation within their organization. Mm -hmm. But I think there, there are potentially other ways to market the fact that you are promoting inclusion and belonging diversity in your marketing materials that are not necessarily images. Uh, so to what Ahmad was saying about, for example, uh, pay equity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it would be really interesting, uh, compensation equity or, or different types of hiring practices, if we're very transparent about, about advertising that our institutions carry policies or yeah. first making sure the institutions carry those policies mm -hmm. and then promoting such policies to people that they recognize oh, there's something systemic happening in this organization that is going to make me feel more included. Because one of the conversations we always have here is, of course, there's, there are different types of racism, but the overarching thing is systemic. Where are the policies that make a difference? So perhaps if we're putting out communication that says, we, we promote blind auditions, we believe in compensation equity, when we filter for, for race or gender or sexual orientation, pay across our organization is equitable. Mm -hmm. I think that could be really powerful. That's not a question, it was just a thought that passed by, sorry. <laughs> it, it just occurred to me. Um, I think too, like, yeah, um, it's okay, like, if your organization is working hard to strive to, you know, we were talking backstage about, um, is it, what is it, yeah, aspirational? Is, yeah. Should marketing be aspirational, or mm -hmm. should, it be, should it be representative of where you are right now? Mm -hmm. And you know, I think it's really important to consider that if your organization is doing the work and you're sending your employees to diversity, equity, inclusion training, and you're asking questions daily and just like, is this, is this in a line with what our strategic plan is? Is this in line with our mission? Um, as long as you're doing that work and are really honest with yourself and your organization, I feel like even if you don't have a diverse um, body of you know students or audiences. Um, I think it'll come because you know I think people of color are really easy, are really good at sniffing out inauthenticity. You know, it's like we know we're like, okay, I see this person like three pages. It's the same black person in yes. this. <laughs> yes. You know, like we can we we really know. So if your organization is working really hard. Um, and you don't have those those results, it's okay. But just keep working hard. And like, how do we how do we grow on this? How do we learn more about something that you know is very new to where we are in the arts right now? And I want to build upon that. I mean, I definitely think it's about cultivating the space, right? So we are not there, but we are working on transforming this space and being intentional, um, because as you mentioned. That happens a lot. Um, I frequently look at organizations and the first thing I look at is um, the people of color who are on the staff, right? So you gave me this amazing brochure. It's lovely as the same person eight times, mm -hmm. but who's actually there and what are the roles that they're in? Um, I think because again, when we talk about our commitment to doing the work, it's not just about the images that are on a brochure. It is about, again, retaining the employees and for us, um, serving the students that are from these populations, let them know that we care about their experiences. Yeah, that's great. I, I wanna lean into something that you were talking about earlier, is that when you have a marketing team, is that marketing team also including other people in the organization? Mm -hmm. And there are a few questions that I had listed here, but I think, I think in a way we can tie some of them together. Um, one of these questions was, is there, is there a diversity, or is diversity a priority of executive leadership? That, that was one. Mm -hmm. And then another was, what are the different checks and balances within the organization? So I think some, previously we were talking about what is the diversity within the actual marketing team? But 
that also leans into what is the diversity amongst the organization as a whole or the leadership in different areas of the organization and do we make sure that we check with those different uh, areas before we push materials out? Is, the, is there enough out there? Um, so I was actually just hired, or I was brought on to Apollo's Fire in August after not having a job for a while and really hurting. Um, and you know, I was, I got this job, I was so excited, and within the first two weeks I was invited to this board retreat where we were writing out our new uh, strategic plan. And you know, there in the middle of the strategic plan, um, and you know, the board was exactly what I imagined it would be for an early music organization. Um, and you know, but that's okay. I was really excited to have had that opportunity to be at the table and to be in dialogue with people who really wanted to hear what I had to say about, you know, how are we going to be a more diverse um, organization? And, you know, I think it needs to be from, it needs to stop, start at the top. Your executive, your board members mm -hmm. all have to be on board. Diversity is just one aspect of it. Um, I think that's the who and the why, or uh, the who and you know, inclusion is the how, and, and equity is the why. Why is it important for us to be representative? Why, why is this essential to our organization? Um, and, you know, I, th th those are questions you have to ask, but, um, you know, having people with a different perspective than is gen that is generally in the room is important because it's not until we start infiltrating you know, these spaces that we actually are allowed to have a voice. But also it's a catch-22 because you have to be able to show up fully, right, in a very transparent space. So sometimes if you're at an institution where you don't feel like you can completely be yourself and you see that they have a culturally insensitive um, brochure or document, how do you engage with that? That's part of it. Um, I know I frequently share with my uh, leadership that I am the person that's going to tell you the truth. There's the inconvenient truth, right? And so when I show up fully, I'm going to tell you, well, I know this seems amazing based on best practices, but it's very different when you look at the audience that you're trying to market to. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, um, I am just always aware of the various different representations that we show up in, excuse me, the various different ways that we show up in the world. So what works for middle America may be very different for a community in Atlanta or someone in LA and New York. But it's really about being honest and having people who can freely say how they feel mm -hmm. without being penalized because you'll find that you have amazing people on your campus, right, who are already there who can kind of help enhance those um, marketing brochures, yeah. et cetera. That's a, that's a really big part of it, being able to, 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 to speak. And I've experienced mm -hmm. that feeling of, should I say something? Will I be causing problems yes. for this person or this department if I bring this up? But I, I just wanted to talk about with, you know, working with what we have. You know, we can't, um, you know, the, the reality is the reality and, and, and who the representation and how we, you know, uh, allow people to fully be present is really important. Um, but, um, you know, ways that we can, we can have checks and balances, um, you know, with what is happening in the now um, is engage people. We have an advisory committee called the Multicultural Awareness Council. Um, it's a group that, I mean, they, they challenge us a lot. They hold our feet to the fire, um, but they're an excellent resource, and it's a group of, um, uh, you know, a diverse group of community members who... Um, you know, provide lots of input and feedback as to how we engage the community, what opportunities we're missing out on, uh, so much low-hanging fruit that we just don't see as an organization, and also just providing candid feedback about the materials we produce. Um, and we had that very conversation about aspirational versus um, what is with our Multicultural Awareness Council. And, and, you know, the kind of the, the, the outcome of that conversation was you have to do both, really. I mean, it's paint a picture that is going to resonate with someone sees that piece, but we have to continually keep working hard to make that reality um, what it should be. 
I was say we're, we're at about the halfway mark here, and I want to remind everyone in the audience that the mics are open if you want to step up and ask a question. Uh, we also have a handful of things that have come in through Slido, so I'm going to start moving my way through, through those just to make sure that the opinions of the room are, are represented fairly. And one that, that came up uh, in the, the live poll, which, Artina, I think you spoke to this a little bit, it says, what steps can your company take to ensure it avoids insensitive campaigns? while also boosting your appeal through diversity and inclusion? Well, I think it's about representation, right? Having people that are um, culturally aware and sensitive, and honestly, empathy. So you mentioned equity. I always say equity can be substituted for empathy, mm -hmm. right? Having people that can intervene and say, this is inappropriate, right? But also having experts. Uh, frequently at our organizations, we have people that are experts, but they don't have the title of being an expert, but they do have a lens. So having people that are in the room and really moving beyond the leadership sometimes as leaders, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many other issues, but having maybe your maintenance worker or someone else, what do you think about this and getting um, their view? I think it'd be helpful. Yeah. I Something that you said that, that really spoke to me, because I view myself the same way. You said you're, you're a truth speaker in your organization. And, and something that you said that I thought about was, you said, before, before something comes up or when something's about to come up, sometimes I ask myself, am I sure I want to interject myself here? Do I want to stir the pot? Do I feel comfortable? Is it going to make this more messy than it needs to be? And perhaps being a little bit prescriptive, but I'm just, if we're here to have a conversation about how we can move this forward, I'm thinking if, if you are a member of an underrepresented group in an organization, I hope that you will feel comfortable or try your, try your best to feel comfortable speaking truth to power because oftentimes if you're there, there's a reason why you're there. Oftentimes there aren't that many of us there in that particular position. Uh, and instead of feeling like we're suffering from imposter syndrome, sometimes if you're the only one in the room, there's, there's a good reason why. And that reason why is because you really, really, really deserve to be there. And a lot of people have worked very hard for you to be there. And it would be a shame if you didn't use that opportunity to say what you believe. And on the other side of that, for, for people who are, are not upper, underrepresented but are in these leadership positions, I hope that you will make sure that you make all these people feel very comfortable to speak, to speak their truth. You know? mm -hmm. Um, let me also add to that, but it's also a catch-22. Right. Um, you should feel comfortable, but also we know there's a large amount of emotional labor, yep. right? So should you always be the person to say, wait a minute, let me bring this to your attention? <laughs> um, so I think it's also important for other people to step up. But mm -hmm. to echo your words, you are there for a reason. You have a particular lens, a particular experience that can really help transform that organization. Absolutely. I think um, I have, I mean, in the same board meeting that I went to um, and talking about being comfortable and, you know, having a safe space for that. Uh, one board member, when we were on the topic of, um, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, they just didn't understand and they interrupted a lot of the conversation and they were like, I feel really uncomfortable. This is making me feel really uncomfortable. And me as a new hire, you know, I was really uncomfortable too. Um, it's like, oh gosh. But, you know, I think in those kinds of moments, um, you just have to, in the same way, not, you, this person wasn't saying anything that was, um, you know, other, I mean, upsetting, of course it was upsetting, but um, I just needed to give them their space too, to ex express that, you know, they don't, they don't understand and they don't understand, and of course, you know, generational differences, but, um, you know, feeling safe and was something that I, in that moment, I didn't really feel that, but other board members and the different people came up to me and they didn't really talk about that specific incident, but they asked my opinion about what we talked about. And that sort of brought me back into the space where I felt, okay, you know, I know I belong here. I know that, um, you know, I was brought here for a reason. I want to go to the go to the mics. Um, my Hi, my name is Chloe, and I wrote it down. Okay, so I definitely agree that there should be inclusiveness and diversity in marketing for whether it's conservatories or summer camps or just orchestras. But I wanted to know how 
do you continue having that DEI past the marketing? So like in person, so like you see the brochure and you see someone that looks like you, but then you get there and it's not as many as you thought it would be. So how would you continue to have that in person? Okay. I can answer that question for you. So um, Interlochen um, Center for the Arts, we have both a camp and an academy. Um, and you're right, you can have a brochure, but frequently when people show up on campus, they're like, wow, it's not as diverse. <coughs> During the academy, uh, the camp's a little more diverse. But for me, um, it's about cultivating relationships. So when I recruit people to Interlochen, um, when I meet people, even students, I'm gonna find you. I'm cultivating relationships, and I'm also developing communities. So for instance, at Interlochen, we've increased our diversity quite a bit. Um, I've been in my position for a year and a half, and so all the people that I have recruited, I have created like a family. So I'm checking on them. We have get-togethers with our new employees, and letting them know you may feel like you are one of a small number, but there is a community here, because part of that is sustainability. We can't just bring people in and check them off and say, hey, we have people, right? Part of the diversity is also inclusion and including them and being very real about that. And also, I feel like I uh, create larger conversations. So how does it feel to be one of the only? How does it feel to walk into town and maybe feel like people are staring at you? Because that's also about providing support as well. Mm -hmm. That's great. I was also thinking, um you know, we have this conversation, EDI, and oftentimes now it's being added with a B for belonging. So, yes, you know, definitely. diversity is that we did the bean counting and we make sure there's enough people from each group in yeah. the room. And the inclusion is that you're allowed to participate in all the stuff. And then belonging means do you actually feel truly comfortable in that space and that there's a place for you where you can be your full authentic self. So hopefully the, the type can of work that you're doing. Can I add one more thing to sure. that? go for it. And also, as the great um, philosopher Solange knows said, um, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you have a right to be mad. So, you know, we talk about belonging. There will, there will be moments where you question yourself. Why did I make this decision to attend this school, to take this position, to be the only but your presence is a gift. Remember that, your presence is a gift. And if you have a moment where you feel othered, it's okay to say, this is how I'm feeling. Right. We're gonna take one question from Slido, then we'll come back to the mic, sorry, just to do it in order. Uh, so the most popular question right now, um, it leans into this question, should your marketing be reflective or aspirational? But the, the follow-up to that is, how do you honestly portray um, how do you honestly portray it if it is aspirational? And what is your advice for making marketing materials more authentic? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, you start by showing real experiences. You, you know, you can't manufacture what you're putting into your materials. They have to be real experiences. Something that someone might experience if they have an interaction with your organization. Um, but, I mean, it, it, it is a challenge. Um, it's a really great question. Um, you know, when we, when we look at the orchestra, you know, there, well, obviously the orchestra appears in our marketing, but it's not a, it's not a diverse body of musicians. Um, and so what I find is I, um, in, in our materials, well, there'll be, you know, photos of um, the orchestra when we might have some of our diversity fellows on the stage. Um, and, you know, I asked the question, is that a genuine reflection of what one's going to experience? And um, I, I think to some degree, yes. Um, I've found that, that um, people recognize, they notice that. Do they know what it is necessarily? They do to some degree, but um, those musicians have been, become a part of our, our community, our broader community in Cincinnati. And, um, you know, are a part of what one can expect to experience if they have an interaction with our orchestra. Um, but it's, I mean, it's, I, I don't have an answer to that question, really. <laughs> no, it's a great question. It's something, I mean, I think that's the reason why we're having a panel discussion about it, is because it's not an obvious answer. Were, were you gonna Can you answer repeat the question one more time? The question was, how do we honestly portray it if it is aspirational? Okay. Um, so, in addition to the regular way the diversity shows up, I think, in the brochures, right, for instance, at a school, how is your curriculum diverse? How are you implementing diverse concepts? So um, at our class, at, excuse me, at Interlochen Arts Academy, this semester I'm teaching an introduction to African American studies class. I'm teaching a class called Black Women, Feminism, and Beyonce. There's other ways to say that we are implementing 
uh, diversity. We are bringing diverse ideals and we are educating people. It's not just the representation, it's also changing the way people think. Mm -hmm. Question from the mic. Hello, my name is Marquise Bradley. I'm a student at the Cleveland Institute of Music and I'm from Philadelphia. And throughout my education, I have often been that one black kid on every page of the brochure. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure many of my peers and colleagues in the room have often been in this position. And I'm wondering, when you're going about presenting people of color on promotional materials, are you focused on promoting their existence or their excellence through your organizations? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that goes back to what Devin said about the storytelling aspect. It's, you know, it, it, it's about more, it should be about more than, than the picture. It's about, it should be about the value and contributions, um, uh, how, how those people who are being portrayed in your materials um, make your organization better, truly better, not just by being there, but by what they bring and the value of what they bring. Um, and there, you know, there are ways to do that. I think we have to think of people more than just you know, their color, right? We have to tell, tell stories. Mm -hmm. That's really, really important. And we have to make sure that people don't feel tokenized or that when you're taking advantage of someone being in an organization, you know there are very few of you, say you're the, you're the one black kid at the festival and they want to put you on the front of the brochure, that you actually are part of what that process is about. Mm -hmm. They've, you've had a conversation about what the aspirations of the organization are, why that's important to them, are you okay with it, things like that. Set the but, boundaries, you know. Yeah, yeah, so that you have a participation or you have some, you have some part of the decision-making process when it comes to how, how your image and how the black body is going to be used for promotion. I think about this a lot of times because I've been in a very similar position. And what I've found in my experience is that oftentimes organizations do not, do not ask you they don't, they don't tell you what they're doing or why they're doing it. I'll be sitting in an orchestra and they have the day where the photos are coming around, the photographer, and they say, oh, I was told I have to make sure I get a picture of you. Now, I know why that is, and I want to say, well, why is that? <laughs> and then, you know, that's interesting. You look around, the only one. But I think if more organizations would be transparent about what they're doing and have a real conversation with people and say, hey, look, we recognize that we're trying to be more diverse and, and equitable and inclusive, and we really want to promote that. Can you help us with the design of our marketing materials? Would you be okay with it if we did this? This is important for us. Mm -hmm. Do you know anyone else you can invite to our festival or to our orchestra so that when we do these materials, we can have something more diverse and that we don't have to lean on the same person every time and make you feel tokenized? Mm -hmm. Really important. Yeah, I think that's really important is, um you know, I said setting the boundaries, but institutions, organizations, I think you should, yes, be inviting people, you know, and just having a conversation. Don't, don't no agenda. Just, you know, get to know the people, whether you're, you know, a student who's really talented, and you, that should just be why you focus on a student anyway. Um, but, you know, get to know your, your, um, your people, and because you you run the risk less if you know the story and the why the person's there, yeah. um, and you know if you're able to see who this person is as a human being with real feelings, with real passion, with real drive, like you really pr don't have to do a lot of work in the marketing aspect of it. It's already done for you because you've uplifted this person and you're you've let them know that they are, you know, a really valuable part of this community because they are amazing and do all these really great things. So um, just, you know, don't be afraid to, to ask for help, I think. It's, it's interesting because I'm thinking about this from, from a leadership perspective and the different things that we should be doing. But if you, are, if you are a student and sometimes you feel powerless, then what position do you have to say something about that when you're sitting in the orchestra and the camera person is taking a knee next to your chair and, and, have, and taking a picture. Or if you're in the fellowship program at the Cincinnati Symphony, you know, and someone comes and does that to you, what, does anyone have any prescriptive advice for how that person should, should react to that so that they can feel less tokenized? Any thoughts about it? 
that's a tough position to be in, mm -hmm. especially for yeah. a young person. Um, yeah. uh, I can talk from the perspective of how we might try to approach something like that as, as a staff um, is, I mean, you know, assume boundaries and respect them, I think is very important. Um, uh, always ask the question, is this the right thing to do? Um, and, and communicate, I mean, you know, have the conversation with, um, you know, like you were just talking about, Weston, with, with the you know, people you are, are portraying in your materials, have the conversation about what, what are the goals of the organization, what is the purpose of the work, and engage them on that process. And some people are gonna say, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm here to learn, I'm here to advance myself, and that's the reason why they are there. And so, you know, it's okay to, to move on. Um, but, you know, I find that um, a lot of people care about, um, uh, about advancing the cause and are, are willing to engage if you invite them. Yeah. But Go ahead. Also, I think it's important um, with a student uh, situation for adults to step up as well. Um, of all backgrounds to intervene. So I know that, notice that disproportionately, we frequently see black and brown students who are the poster children for scholarship recipients. Mm -hmm. And so we know that scholarships overwhelmingly are pretty diverse, they're pretty broad. So when we have these images, it's not just these kind of positive things, but also the stereotypes and what stereotypes those send out. So having conversations about what that means as well. Very interesting point. Mm -hmm. it's it brings up this, this old term of poverty pimping, mm. you know, and what that means. Uh, the idea that, hey, look, we're an institution that has all of these poor black and brown kids on scholarship, and we want to put that, put that up and put that out in front of people. Mm -hmm. what, is, what message does that send to the audience about how you feel about those people? Are you suggesting that you believe that, that all these people are, are poor or whatever? You know, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why we aren't represented in the ways that we need to be in institutions. And, being poor is not the number one reason, and, mm -hmm. and it's one of the reasons in some cases, but it's not the only reason. Um, I want to skip to a couple of questions that, are combined, that I can combine here on Slido. What do you do when a school or organization uses your face for their diversity marketing and you have no relation to the school or organization? I think so. <laughs> and, uh, which I have personally never seen that, but I actually heard someone mention that to me yesterday. And the next question is, does anyone consider what happens when the student or the students being featured in the materials are not interested in being singled out? Mm -hmm. I, think I, think we, I think we stumped the yeah. panel. Well, yeah, well I, you know, two years ago, we were, I think, looking at these questions and, you know, orchestras were like, how are we going to get people in the door? conservatories, colleges, we have a really big problem here. And the first thing that like, of course, like we, we heard tokenizing. It's like, that was the thing. Like, oh, we have our, you know, our woman composer on the program and that's it. That's the only thing we do. We have this person of color coming in. Like that's, like, that's enough. And that was just so tiring to just see. I had to turn down so many things because I was like, I, sorry, I just can't be a part of this. So I'm really glad that that was two years ago because we are in, I think, a really different place um, these, the, these days. But I, yeah, it's, it's, it's really tough when you are featured in, you don't know about something and you're being blasted on a campaign that's something you have no recollection of. So, you know, like I was saying earlier, set the boundaries. You're okay, you're, you're totally in control of your body, of who you are and what you represent. So, you know, if something makes you feel uncomfortable, go, go talk to the person and say, this makes me uncomfortable because of this. And maybe from this experience, they, whoever is leading this campaign or whatever, realizes why it makes you feel uncomfortable. And there is something about um, like your marketing staff. I think if you don't have a if you don't have a woman or a woman of color or someone of color on your marketing staff, I think that you're really making a, a big mistake because um, and it's not just you know we we get into these um, spaces where it's just driven by men and it's really hard um, to be in that space even for me as a man. So if you have a really diverse marketing team or even consultants that you're bringing in um, 
you know, I think th that's where the checks and balances comes in. Let me say real quickly, if you're a person who shows up on marketing materials for an organization you have absolutely nothing to do with, you should call them out because totally. that's blatantly unethical. Um, but really quickly, we have about five minutes left and I wanna try to get through as many people at the mics as we can. We have four. You were here first, so go, go ahead. Hey, uh, my name is Marquis. I'm a senior at the New England Conservatory. Um, so I just wanted to preface my question just by saying that like, so I've, um, I've seen uh, students who um, were like, I don't know, maybe they've been, they were told like, hey, you're gonna get a photo shoot, right? And they're all excited and they get a photo shoot. And then they become like the poster child of like marketing and stuff. And um, it was just a really weird experience because they got kind of had like mixed emotions. They're like, okay, they didn't feel like, they felt like they were contributing to a false image and they didn't have a lot of control over the situation. Um, but in terms of like, um, I guess bridging the gap between um, DEI, or not DEI, but like marketing and the, uh, the actual experience at the institution. Um, I guess my question is, right, because so the, uh, like the first thing you see when you go into a space is the people, right? And then the next thing is the art. And I understand that, um, you know, diversity is a process and it's hard to, um, to change the demographics of an institution. But my question is, how hard is it to diversify art? I mean, literally putting a picture of, uh, of William Grant Still or Florence Price, I mean, we're talking about a $40, $50 picture frame, yet I walk into like so many institutions and I don't even, I don't even see that, you know? So if we're gonna make our marketing diverse, why can't, how, how hard is it to make art more diverse? I, I think it's not that hard, no. right? It's just, I, I, think, I think you nailed it. It's, it. You nail around the head, it's not that hard, it's just a matter of, of choice, and I think that has a lot to do with, with leadership. Yeah. Um, that's something that actually I can speak to that's happened in a way that's really positive at Juilliard, is that we have a president who's very forward-thinking this way, it's a high priority for him, and he's changed the artwork that's actually around the building so that it's, it's more reflective and more diverse. Uh, one of the things we've done in the preparatory division that I lead at Juilliard is amongst our large ensembles, orchestras, wind ensemble, every program has composers of color or, or women composers. Every single program. That's always the case. You know, there's, there are certain things, you know, when you're dealing with a large orchestra institution, you have a collective bargaining agreement, and you can't, you can't just fire people or change the audition system so that you just only hire black or brown people. But there are certain things that you can change tomorrow if you want to. Mm -hmm. I mean, the... An orchestra could say, starting next season or the two seasons from now, which we haven't planned yet, every program will be represented in this way. When you walk into the building, the artwork that people are gonna see when they walk in will look like this. That doesn't require you to, to have a big negotiation and deal with, deal with the union or have arguments with people. You just do it. So uh, a lot of it is just making sure, I think this is a part of, of having diversity in leadership. Do you have the leaders who actually want to just make these things happen? Because that's actually, I agree with you, it's not that hard. You know, $50 picture frame, put it up, right? And we are playing Florence Price next year, it's gonna be great. Um, so <laughs> over here. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Steven, and thank you guys so much for everything you've said so far. Really appreciate it. Um, I feel like I've been in a situation where I have been the poster child many times, and I have had the experience of not actually being part of the program. I just happened to be at the event. And um, I'm in the promotional materials for that. And I have called them out, so thank you for that. Um, so my question is, how are you making sure that you are not using the same pool of individuals to express diversity at your institutions? Um, I'll answer that question. I think for us, um, it's about being intentional and strategic uh, when we create these documents. And also, it's about having conversations and doing um, reviews, right? So looking at the type of materials, but also, is there a reason why you have this particular person in this picture, right? Or is it just, we wanted to add more diversity? So just being really intentional about it. One more? We're down to our last minute, so last question. 
All right, great. Peace, family. My name is Ms. Black. I'm a vocalist, a classically trained vocalist. Um, but more importantly, I'm just a vocalist. <laughs> um, my question is, I've noticed in education specifically, we advocate for black and brown bodies to be in these spaces. We then bring them into these spaces. But instead of creating change in the structure, the foundational structure, we'll do a little urban programming and make them head or a role or something in that little urban, urban programming that is a subsection, a subcategory of what the main, the meat of the situation is. That's where the change needs to happen. So um, I, was at, I wanted to ask, do you guys see this as a trend? Also, how can we advocate for the main event, the main space that needs this change to be created? And how can we stop putting, it's almost like a safety net. We're just gonna, re, we cover our bases. Um, we're gonna give you something cute, something quaint. You got the role, it's good, it's great, but still we don't have to apply that across the whole organization. That's I, that is a really great question. I wish there was more time to answer, but I'll try and you know provide what we can. This thing's telling me time's up. Um, you're you're right, and I, I, that same concept trans transfers into my world at orchestras as well. In that traditionally, and you'll see this in every city. There's the Black History Month concert, the MLK mm -hmm. celebration, and there and people love and cherish those events. Our Black community in Cincinnati. Um, they want and they love our Classical Roots concert, but we also have many, many more people who say that needs to be a part of everything you do. And I think it's about changing the art, which uh, this gentleman over here was talking about. And, and that's really what we have to do. We have to show those faces that are representative of the audience we want to attract, African American, Latinx, and women composers, other composers, guest artists, conductors, orchestra members on our stage and do it on a regular basis. And, and those are the types of things that we're looking at at our organization and other orchestras as well. Can I yeah. say something? <laughs> yeah, no, no, you too, please. No, sorry, sorry. Oh. Can, I, can I say one thing real quick? Just I want to, <laughs> sorry, I want, no, first, because I want to be respectful of the next group and the time when they have to be on stage and we, we do have to stop, I know it's really important. It's always the case, these conversations, we never have enough time to actually have them, but we can all stick around uh, just out there in the hallway, and if people had questions or something that they wanted to say or, or put out there, just please join us over here in just, just a minute. We'd be happy to talk about it, stick around for another 15 minutes or so and, and have that conversation. Uh, but for now, I think we have to get up and go and just give one nice round of applause for our panelists.